Hello there! If you've been wondering what the difference between flow matching models and diffusion models is, then this video is for you. You might have noticed that while diffusion models like Stable Diffusion or Imagine made the state-of-the-art image generators just a couple of years ago, these days diffusion models see competitors in flow matching models like Flux and Stable Diffusion 3 that seem to be steadily taking over the spotlight. So what changed? Why are researchers suddenly shifting from diffusion to flow matching. I was asking myself this question since I already knew how diffusion models work, but I kept wondering what does flow matching actually do differently. So in this video we'll unpack exactly that difference. We'll start with a recap of how diffusion models are trained and how they generate images, and then we'll dive into flow matching models step by step, side by side with diffusion models so you can see precisely where they diverge. All right, grab your coffee and let's dive in. Before we get to flow matching, let's see how diffusion models work. At their core, diffusion models learn to reverse noise. They get an image of pure noise as input and learn how to transform it step by step into a realistic image. But how to teach the neural network inside the diffusion model to do that? To find out, let's see what happens during diffusion model training. First, we take a real image from our training dataset, let's call it x1. Then we pick a random time step t between 0 and 1, where t equals 1 stands for a clean image with no noise, t equals 0 stands for an image with just noise, and we call it 0 because it contains 0 information. And t between 0 and 1 stands for something between noise and no noise. So that's what a time step t represents, how far along we are in the noise process. Now during training we start from the clean image x1 and we have sampled t as a random value between 0 and 1. And we are ready to generate our training data in the so-called forward diffusion step. By adding Gaussian noise epsilon to each pixel of x1, we generate a noisy version of x1, which we call xt. The amount of noise we add depends on a predefined schedule called bt, which increases with increasing value of t, such that at t equals 1 we have our clean image and at t equals 0 we have so much noise that the image becomes just pure Gaussian noise. And everything in between are partially corrupted versions of the image. And of course, to keep the image values of xt in the same range as x1, we also need to consider here only a fraction at of x1. But we are not quite done in writing the forward diffusion formula, because we can define a relationship between at and bt to combine them into just one variable. How? By assuming the input x1 to be unit variance and constraining the resulting noisy image xt to stay unit variance as well. The noise epsilon has a variance of 1 by construction because we draw epsilon from a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1, so to keep the total variance of xt also equal to 1, the variances from the two parts must add up correctly to 1. By defining alpha t to be at squared, we can deduce that at is square root of alpha t and bt is square root of 1 minus alpha t. With that, we can write the forward diffusion formula that is generating our training data for our diffusion model like this. Mathematically, this diffusion process, which we use to generate a noisy data sample xt from a clean data sample x1, can also be viewed as learning a stochastic differential equation, or short SDE, where dWt is just Gaussian noise. Just mentioning this, because it will make it easier to see the parallel to flow matching models later, now you can forget about this SDE, because we're back to the training of our diffusion model, where for this training step we sampled the time step t and generated the noisy image xt via the forward diffusion process. So now we ask our neural network usually a unit, but it can also be a transformer, which gets the time step t as positional embeddings, to execute the backward diffusion process. Process. How? By letting the neural network predict the noise epsilon that we added in the forward diffusion. Of course, the neural network after initialization does not predict the right noise epsilon because the neural network is just a bunch of random weights, so the network will predict something like epsilon hat. 
Thus, we need to train those weights to predict epsilon hats that match the real epsilons. So we just use a loss function to train this. We train the neural network with a simple L2 loss between the predicted noise epsilon hat and the true noise epsilon that we actually added. That's it. The network learns to estimate how much noise there is in a given noisy image. So to recap, the entire training process is you pick a random image from the data set, you choose a random time step, add the corresponding amount of noise to the clean image, and train the model to predict the noise that you just added. That's the entire training loop and we get the really powerful neural net that can predict the noise which was added to the image by doing this over many different images over the entire training data set with many random time steps t. And then we can use this powerful neural network model that has learned to predict noise epsilons from any image to do useful stuff with it, like generating clean images. How? We use the epsilon predicted by the network to reverse the diffusion process. That means we take the formula we used for adding noise and rearrange it to solve for the clean image instead. In other words, all we did here is pulling x1 to the left hand side and rename it to xt plus 1. That's it. It's just the same equation turned around and feel free to do this exercise on paper. And with this backward diffusion formula, we can now start the image generation process. We begin by giving our trained diffusion model a completely noisy image as input, and we let the model predict the noise present in the image. Then using our formula, we combine the noisy input x0 and the predicted epsilon, which effectively means that we subtract the predicted noise from the image to get a cleaner image. And we do not subtract all the noise in one go, though. We start from pure noise and use our trained model to iteratively remove a bit of noise at a time. At each step, we ask what direction should I move this noisy sample to make it look more like a real image? And we nudge it into that direction repeatedly until the noise slowly transforms into a coherent image. Why don't we just subtract all the predicted noise in one go? Because the model only learned to denoise specific amounts of noise at time steps t, which are often not t equals zero. So what the model learns is, given an image that's been corrupted by a specific amount of noise corresponding to the time step t, what direction, so what noise should I remove to slightly move this sample towards the data distribution? And if we try to jump all at once, we'd end up far off the data manifold and get a blurry mess, and the model never directly sees transitions across noise levels. It just learns the gradient of the data distribution at that level of noise. So when we use the model for generation, we can't just predict the noise once and subtract it all at once. We must integrate these small steps over the whole noise schedule from t equals 0 to t equals 1, using the model's prediction at each step to guide us. So the model takes hundreds or even thousands of small denoising steps, gradually walking through image space until we reach a realistic sample. So to recap, here are the training and inference loops for a diffusion model. Diffusion models learn to reverse a noising process described by this stochastic differential equation. During training, we take a real image, sample a random time step, add Gaussian noise according to a schedule corresponding to the sampled time step, and teach a model, a neural network, to predict exactly that noise. The model is trained with a simple L2 loss between the predicted and true noise. Then, at inference time, to generate new images, we start from pure noise and iteratively apply the model in reverse. Each step slightly denoises the image until we end up with a realistic sample at t equals 1. And if you want to know how to generate images from text, watch our previous videos on this. Okay, so far so good it was for diffusion models. Now enter flow matching models. While diffusion was reversing this stochastic differential equation, flow matching says, let's simplify this and think about making this completely deterministic by removing the Gaussian noise term here. So now we have this ordinary differential equation instead, it's not stochastic anymore, which is much simpler to solve. And flow matching solves this by learning v, the velocity field via a neural network. 
And let's take a moment to see how simple this ODE really is. You might remember from high school physics that velocity is just a change in position over time. So if we know the velocity field, meaning that we know the velocity at every point in time, we can recover the end trajectory by integrating it over time. In our case, that means that the final state x1 is simply the starting point x0 plus the integral of the velocity field at every point in time from 0 to 1. So if we train a neural network that learns this velocity field v, we can use it to move from a random noise x0 all the way to a clean image x1 just by following this equation. What does this concretely mean and how do we train a flow matching model? Like for diffusion models, we take x1, a data point from our image database we use for training. Then again, we sample a time step t between 0 and 1, but now it gets much simpler. We also sample x0, which is just an image with complete noise of the same size as x1. Then from x1, x0, and t, we generate xt, which is just a linear interpolation of x1 and x0. Linear interpolation, which we also visualize here again on the right. We can compute the ground truth velocity field just by subtracting x0 from x1. By computing the derivative of xt with respect to t, we can see that this constant velocity field is the right one for our linearly interpolated xt. Now, we can instantiate our model, a neural network, to predict v. It takes us input the current point xt and the time step t, which we can provide, for example, through positional embeddings. If we use a vision transformer where xt can be represented as image patches along the sequence dimension. To train the network, we use a simple mean squared error loss between the predicted velocity v hat from the model and the ground truth velocity v that we computed earlier. By minimizing this loss over many random samples of images, noise, and time steps, the model gradually learns to predict the correct flow field, that is, how to move from noise to data at any point in time. Now, to generate images with our trained flow matching model, we simply start by generating random noise x0, let the network predict v, and integrate the ODE forward in time, via our formula here to arrive at x1. Since we don't know the final image x1, we rely on our neural network to tell us the velocity field v. We can let a numerical solver like adaptive Runge Kutta to do our integration for us. And the solver starts at t equals 0 from pure noise, repeatedly evaluates v to see in which direction to move, and takes adaptive steps larger when the vector field is smooth and smaller when it changes rapidly until we reach t equals 1, the final image. And you might ask, why do we need multiple steps instead of just one? Even if in theory the true velocity is constant, if learned perfectly in practice, the model has only learned an approximation of this global path and the velocity might vary along the path, especially if it hasn't converged well. The ODE solver, which can be Euler or Runge Kutta, needs to query the model at multiple time steps to integrate safely and track this curve. And the best part is that, unlike diffusion models who need hundreds of denoising steps, with flow matching we need 5 to 15 model calls, which are forward passes during inference. So depending on your integrated step size on tolerance, you can really get away with way fewer forward passes than with a diffusion model. That's why flow matching models can generate high quality images in a fraction of the time, but on the other hand, diffusion models are extremely stable to train, so they've been refined for years, the noise prediction loss is simple and well behaved, and flow matching models can be a bit trickier because they don't rely on random noise at each step, uh, so their training can become unstable if the estimated flow field isn't accurate everywhere. But modern methods like rectified flow have solved many of those issues, and mathematically, diffusion models and flow matching are almost two sides of the same coin, so let's have them side by side again. Flow matching models skip the randomness of diffusion and replace it with a smooth deterministic flow, simplifying the STE to just a simple ODE. For training flow matching models, we sample a data point from our data set then a time step t and a random noise sample x0. Then we interpolate between the real image and the noise and compute the ground truth velocity. The neural network learns to predict this velocity. So in contrast to diffusion models where the neural net has learned to predict the noise we had added, 
we now predict velocities. We use a mean squared error loss to enforce the neural network to predict the right velocity. And at inference, we start from noise and integrate the learned velocity field using a solver, which takes adaptive steps to trace the flow all the way to the final image. So that was it. Now you have them here side by side. Diffusion models work by learning to undo random noise, taking hundreds of tiny stochastic steps to gradually turn pure noise into an image. And flow matching models, on the other hand, learn a deterministic flow, a smooth path that directly transports points from the noise distribution to the data distribution. Because the velocity field in flow matching is continuous and deterministic, we can use efficient ODE solvers to trace that path in just a handful of steps, sometimes tens instead of hundreds like with diffusion. That's why modern flow matching models can generate high quality images so much faster. They use this flow based formulation instead of classic diffusion. So in a sense, the flow matching keeps the best parts of diffusion. So the powerful training objective, but replaces the random walk with a guided shortcut. That was it for today's explainer. If you like this breakdown, give the video a like and hit subscribe for more AI coffee breaks. See you next time. Okay, bye.